one. What's every up, everybody? We are live. We have Jerry Fultz and Karen Stupples joining myself and Captain Ron Dunn. Uh, just uh, why don't you start off, Ronnie? What's going on down there in SoCal, brother? Well, they just opened up the golf courses this weekend. The weather's beautiful. The courses were a little rough, to be honest with you. The rough was very rough. Sand trap bunkers were hideous. Didn't hit one in two days, so that was pretty impressive. But all good here. I'm just looking forward to get started with Jerry and Karen. This is one I've been looking forward to. <laughs> I got I got out and played the other day too. We've been playing for a while in Canada. We're uh, we're lucky up here. But uh, what about I? We we all know everybody's uh, staring at Florida with the with those eyes. Everything going down there. Uh, Jerry and Karen, say what's up, please. Hey. Hello. We love it in Florida. Golf courses never shut down here. Uh, yeah. New. New rules like everybody else, but uh, play is fast, play is good, and the courses are phenomenal. And uh, it's Cinco de Mayo. How's the tequila flowing in uh, Florida? Fantastic. Loving it. I don't know if, if you can hear it, but the, the ice is rattling in my glass. Yep. We are, we, uh, we are all celebrating. Uh, Ron's got some Patron. I've got some Patron, and there's uh, some margaritas flowing in, in Florida. So, so that's awesome. Uh, we just want, uh, you know, you guys are uh, pretty well known out there, Golf Channel analysts, but uh, maybe if you can share just a little bit of a brief background of, of who, who you are for the listeners if they don't already know you. And uh, yeah, we don't have to go too in, into detail. We can get into the fun stuff. Karen Stupples is uh, from the UK deal on the southeast coast of England, 2004 Women's British Open champion, as well as <laughs> 2000 Tucson Open champion. And about six or seven years ago, decided that uh, she didn't have the passion for playing much competitive golf anymore and kind of hung along with the Golf Channel people to see if she could learn the trade and maybe get her foot in the door. And now she's uh, revered by many people inside the industry as one of the best analysts and on course reporters. And I am Jerry Fultz, a overpaid prima donna talking head who's been doing on-course commentary and various different things for Golf Channel for 25 years. From Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, went to numerous colleges and has really been honing his skills on the golf course ever since. Yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> N numerous colleges, <laughs> numerous brilliant. colleges. Why, did you get kicked out of a few? Uh, I actually did get kicked out. I went to Oral <laughs> Roberts University for a year. Figure that I got kicked out about six times and quit about eight, but I did actually finish the year a junior college and then finished up at University of Arizona a little bit before they were actually a good golf school. Right on. Then you went to our Q school, right? And I heard you were playing with uh, Furyk at Q school. Where'd yeah, you hear that? Uh, just the other day, a couple birds were chirping over there and outside of Orlando, Florida, blew on my window and told me that. I played in Q school finals a lot. The only thing I did well as a professional golfer, um, I've never played to the level Karen did uh, in, in her career, but the only thing I did well is I always made it through second stage. It's back in, in the day, if you didn't make it past second stage, you had no status anywhere. When my back got completely against the wall, it was either play well here or go get a job. I played well enough to, to still have status. Um, 93, the finals at PGA West, played a practice around Jim Furyk, U University of Arizona product, who I liked and we were friends. Uh, didn't know him that well. And, you know, he's got a quirky swing and thank God uh, his dad never let him change it. And I made a flippant, offhanded, regretful comment. <laughs> but uh, Jim, I like playing with you because your swing looks just like mine feels. <laughs> <laughs> He's about 70 million, 60 or 70, maybe even more million in earnings on the course, much less what he's made off the course. He could buy me eight times over, and he's still very gracious to me uh, in spite of that. He seems like one of those, uh, you know, classic awesome dudes out there. I've, I've got a question because you did win a, a Nike Tour event back then, Web now uh, the Corn Ferry, I guess. Um, so was it? there was no top 25 back then. I guess it was just like everybody went through – the, the, the stages you had to go uh, to the path to the tour all the way through final stage Q school or? Uh, no, back then the Q school was for, there were uh, 50, 45 for 40 cards. It get, kept dwindling depending on how many people on the, uh, on the corn ferry tour now are, were graduating. But when I first started, it was 50 or 45 cards went to the PGA tour from Q school. And then the rest got either exempt or conditional corn ferry status back then. Gotcha, gotcha. And I mean, Karen, your your story is well documented. I I, I absolutely love it uh, with the uh, serving at a restaurant and some members. Mm -hmm. and, and you hear this so much. Like I've been a club pro for you know more than a decade, and there's always those 
you know, that's the best thing about the club environment is there's these, there's these members. I was privileged to experience, a, you know, similar things with a mm -hmm. whole bunch of lot less talent, but just like people stepping up, recognizing, you know, having a little bit of, uh, you know, disposable income to help somebody out like that. Can you, can you talk about that a bit? Well, it, it, was, it, was, it was wild to me because I had, you know, come out here to university in America, realized that, that I wanted to play golf on the LPGA because I'd been exposed to it from my time at college. And so I figured that, that I'd need to go home and work because going through Q school wasn't inexpensive. You know, it was something that I needed to save up for. You know, my parents never had an awful lot of money and whatever they had, they'd literally blown on plane tickets to, to get me to America to go to school. So... I basically had to work and get a job. And one of those jobs was at a golf course called Etching Hill, which was just outside of Folkestone. And I would wait tables, sort of behind the bar. And I would always have this, this regular table because none of the other waitresses would want to wait on this table because they were, they were quite particular with how they wanted their food and how they wanted stuff. And it, to me, it seemed very easy because they would talk about golf and, and they were in having not played golf, but been playing tennis. So they would play tennis and then come into the golf course and to, to have a dinner in the evening. So they've been playing tennis and they were all chatting about my golf. And, and one day, his, the, one of the guys, his name was Keith Rawlings and his wife's name was Sue. Keith said to me, Karen, he said, I keep seeing you in the local paper. You keep winning these amateur tournaments. What in the world are you doing still working? Why aren't you a professional and, and playing golf? And I said, you know, I'm trying to save up the money to give it a go. I said, you know, I figured that if I, if I work hard, I could have enough money put away to, for, for maybe in two years' time to, to give it a go. He was like, oh, okay, um, wow. So I went off and I cleared the table and I brought some desserts out. And he said, you know, my wife and I have been talking and we really think you deserve a chance to try. He said, we've been lucky in our lives. He said, we've, we've, got a, we've done very well for ourselves. And we would, we would like for you to write us a budget and come to my office in the morning. And uh, we'll see what we can do. So this is like about 11 o'clock at night. So I finish up my shift at the, at the course. And I, I was up till like two or three in the morning writing out the budget. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how much it's going to be for the flights and the hotels and the rental cars and one first stage and then second stage and then the entry fee and then the whole thing. I'm like, so I put it all together and I figured out it was going to cost me 10,000 pounds all total everything all in the entry fee the flights the travel everything and the per season per season yes yeah. yeah and so I, I i went to him with with my budget and i said this is you know this is what i have and he said okay this looks good i'm like what he said yes he said there's just one thing i'm like oh here we go and he said i i don't expect you to do this first time he said i'm going to do this for three years because you deserve an opportunity and you don't need all the pressure on you for the first time to just to do it one time. So he was very, so giving that, you know, just to give me that chance and to be so understanding that he, that he was able to give me the opportunity to, to do it, not just the once, but, but for, but for this, for the next few years, if I needed it, um, it was very cool. And, uh, I, I'm not sure that I would ever have made it out to America without his help because I don't know if I could have ever made enough money being a waitress to, to have saved up enough and lived at the same time in order to make it. But uh, yes, he, he, uh, I made it first time. I got my card the first year and I've not really looked back ever since. I've seen her uh, culinary skills around the house and her ability to <laughs> you know, wait the table pretty well. She, she would have made a, a boatload as a waitress. <laughs> That's an incredible story. Um, That's and, a great, uh, great story. Yeah, I, I just I, cut grass on the side. I'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, you'd you'd have made it, but yeah, I mean, I know from talking to several rookies uh, now. First of all, the pressure that that would have taken off of uh, you know your Q school, um, yeah. you know, to say like you have three years, it's not like a make or break, which I know a no. lot of these women you know have that uh, you know hanging over their head. And now, 2020, fast forward, I know that the over under. Uh, for expenses out there with caddies, travel all around the world, et cetera. It's like, mm -hmm. I've heard around $80,000, um, you know, and a yeah. lot of those women aren't, aren't even coming close to, to breaking even out there. So what a substantial uh, investment that is. It, it was amazing because I only really knew him from sitting at my table, you know, when I, would, when I was waitressing on him. And th there were other people that I had known better uh, that had been part of my amateur golf career that, that, enjoyed me yeah, playing amateur golf with them that, that didn't want to help. I had made a few proposals and, and, and it wasn't accepted. 
And so for, for him to have done that to me at the time was, was pretty good. I'd, I'd taken some rejections, but for him to offer it without, without me even thinking anything was pretty, pretty fantastic. But you, you raise a great point, Casey, and yeah. a lot of people don't see that side of professional golf. On the LPGA, it's a little more evident than on the PGA Tour, because really anybody with a PGA Tour card is going to be able to cover expenses simply with endorsement money. Um, but I, I have donated. Natalie Sheary is a friend of ours who always seems she's caddying at a local golf course here to try and raise money each year to get to Q School, to get her semester status back, to get her LPGA status back, which she's had. And, uh, and Haley Moore. Last fall, her family doesn't come from privilege, and she needed money just to enter Q School. Um, I think it's probably unethical for me to even invest in somebody. It's not an investment. It's a gift. But it's a gift. I, I've, I've tried helping out when I can because there are so many of those LPJ players right now who aren't playing who need to play and make money because they're not, you know, they're not flying private jets, and they're, and they're great players. And, it, and it's really sad that we, uh, we kind of lose sight of that when we – when we watch TV and watch the LPJ tour and the greatness of it, how many players are, are making that sacrifice to pursue the dream? Yeah, I'm a second year caddy out there and I worked for a lot of rookies last year and uh, I can just see the stress with them, yeah. you know, of, of trying to make that, that check. And, you know, it turns into once you make the, you know, first of all, it turns into you're hovering around the cut line, you know, that whole like tiger mentality, I'm showing up to win. Well, you know, you, it gets to a certain stage where the pressure and you miss a few cuts in a row. And it's like, now I'm just trying to make the cut. Um, and you're not going to because that's that stress is involved. And then when you do miss the make the cut, you know, for some reason, it's just like, well, let's just kind of hover back down in 60th and take a few grand home. So, uh, you know, I've seen it firsthand. And uh, yeah, it's it's, it's a, it seems like a high stress, stressful well, environment. From personal experience, you know, in my first year on tour, obviously, it was it was that rookie. It was very difficult. And any time that you can even take home a couple of thousand dollars or even a thousand dollars, it feels like winning. You know, it feels like a win to you. And I remember um, my first ever top 10 was in Springfield, Illinois, my, my first year on tour at the rail. And what year is this? In, uh, that would be 99, my, which was my rookie year. You don't look old at all. <laughs> I am so old. You're so hot. No, oh, <laughs> well, he's, he's so lovely. And uh, excuse me whilst I blush. Um, and so I, I, I made $22,000 for my first ever top 10. I literally felt like I had won the life lottery. Like I had won the lottery and I'm like, felt like the richest person ever. Cause I, not even in my wildest dreams could I have imagined ever making $22,000 in a year, let alone in one week. It was just off the charts. So I went down to New Orleans and celebrated on Bourbon Street, as you do. Hopefully I'm Mardi Gras. <laughs> yeah. Karen, was Pete, Pete and Sue, your sponsors, Pete, your sponsors, Pete and Sue, were they around 2004? Pete and Sue. The, yes, they Sue? were. Keith, were they yeah. with you in Sunnydale? They were. They, they were able to come up because Sunnydale was the closest part to, closest course uh, to, to where we grew up. And, and they came up and watched and was part of it. And I, I don't think they've ever been more excited about golf ever to see that some, something that they had helped uh, get on, on the road what was good they, they had invested in a piano and a, in a pianist as well um, but really to see me win win the British Open was was pretty awesome for them the that's, that's incredible I, I got goosebumps not sure if it's Patron or not but that story is just touching very touching story <laughs> And sorry, uh, uh, not to keep going uh, with, with Karen, Jerry, but she's way more talented and way more beautiful on camera than you. So we just want to keep asking her questions. Um, but uh, <laughs> she, won, uh, she, 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 she talked about winning the life lottery when she won 22 grand. And then she met me. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, starting, did I hear that you started Eagle Albatross in the final round? Like, is that the most insane start to a professional golf event from like anybody in the history like really i think so uh sunning sunningdale has obviously it's two par fives to start yes i think so i i knew i was one shot back going into the final round knew that i had to get off to a fast start and figured that an eagle on one of those first two holes would at least draw me level with, with the lead group so um i eagled the first and i'm like okay this is great life is good now i've just got to keep going um, driver five iron and drive, driver five iron uh, into the hole. On both holes. On both holes. Both both holes. Driver five iron at the first with a with a, with a fifteen foot putt and driver five iron in the hole at the second. But you were always one of the longer hitters, top ten in distance. Yeah. So yeah. 
Yeah, the, the first was about 500 yards and the second was like 522. A lot of people have tried researching that. It, it, it's hard to, because nothing, you know, old stuff's not archived in terms of scorecards. Nobody can come up with a, a start to a professional golf tournament round, much less a major, much less a final round. No that way. Comes, that comes within two shots of that, actually. I, 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 I'm sure it, it doesn't get old recounting and reliving that. And I'm actually, uh, I think that's fantastic hearing it from firsthand from, from your account. So really, really, really cool. I think it's that so five iron is still on your mantle, right? It is. It's right back there on the, in that bag. It's, yeah, um, yeah. The, the funny thing is, is that, you know, for, with my background and where I came from, like, you don't really know if, if winning tournaments is even, even in your, in your future. You don't know if, if winning a major is in your future. You don't know, you know, if anything, anything of that's going to happen. And then when you, you start eagle at Albatross, you're like, wait a minute, this is, this feels like it's meant to be. And, you know, it was just felt like it was just meant to be that week for me. And, and it really changed, not, not so much for me, but it changed, changed life for my family. Um, it, it was, I was able to give them things that I would never have given them before. They were able to be, they, they were being somebody, you know, they, they had, their daughter had won the British Open. It was my, my parents and it was kind of nice. My father, you know, to, to round off that story, he, count, he comes from a family, he has nine uncles. All of them were scratch or single figure handicaps before the Second World War. And they all went off to war and then they, then they didn't play golf again when they came back. But they were all artisan members of Royal St. Courts, which meant they, they did work on the golf course. They probably enjoyed mowing grass like I do too. But they, uh, they did work on the golf course and then they were able to play golf after a certain time. But after the Second World War, none of them played golf again. So it kind of feels like um, they were all there, you know, looking down, making sure that everything was going right for me. And it just seems like the right thing at the right time and being in the right place, like I was meant to do it. Yeah, That's that was probably the... that was your best uh, year on tour by far. And then the next year, yeah. 2005, your first appearance in the Solheim Cup for two experiences. What, what was that like, team playing? It was, it was I mean, it was the, the first time you play on a, on a team event like that, you feel so out of place because most of the team has already been there before because they don't really like to put a lot of rookies on the team. So as a rookie, it's, you, you, everybody knows where they're going, what they're doing, all the parties, all the stuff, all the things, all the photographs, all the signing, everything that has to go on behind the scenes, everybody knows. They all kind of have their partners already set. And as a rookie, you have to kind of really slot in to, to figure out where you are. And it, and it was, it kind of almost felt a little lonely because you, you don't really know how, how things are going to work because everybody is so intense and they're so, they're all trying to win and, and they're all trying to do the best they can. And it was just a, a very intimidating environment being surrounded by players that were trying to play the best golf and represent their, their continent as or their country as, as best they could. And it was a, a tough first year, first experience. I enjoyed it very much. You won. No, no, the first one we lost, oh. 2005. 2011. Oh, uh, Carmel, yeah. Yeah, two, 2005 was my first you one. 2011 was one. Five. Yeah. You guys got demolished. <laughs> but it was, <laughs> but it yeah. was, um, but the second time around, it was a lot easier. Uh, playing in the second one, knowing what to expect, knowing what to do, knowing what, knowing what uh, we wanted as a team, it just felt much easier second time, which, and, is, which, is, uh, why, which is why rookies rarely get picked. And by the way, those uh, in my broadcasting career, not to interject myself into an actual meaningful conversation, those are the two, the first two Solheim Cups I did. I did that first one, and I didn't do another one again until 11. And I believe we were kind of unsure because there's not a lot of archive for it, but I believe I followed Karen in, in uh, Carmel, in Crooked Stick, that mm -hmm. first year. I was playing against Meg Mallon. That was the hardest... The hardest thing to do ever because Meg Mallon has always been a good friend of mine when we played, when we played on tour. And in fact, she wrote a number of really nice letters for me for, to, the, to, to get, for, you know, first off to get my green card and then and for, for my citizenship. You know, she's always been, you know, one of my, you know, American sponsors to kind of help me become part of society here in America. And um, it was really hard to, to play. I found it really difficult to play against her. Did you be and now look at the two of you guys shacking up there and outside of Orlando. You got the trophy <laughs> now, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> and and speaking well on that, 
your guys' Twitter feed, I've uh, been uh, checking it out uh, quite substantially there. Uh, uh, lots of comical uh, uh, sense. It looks like she's, she's the hard worker and you like to supervise, sit back and have Miller time from what I can see. It's quite <laughs> comical. There's absolutely nothing inaccurate about that observation <laughs> at all. Matter of fact, I'm going to actually tweet a picture of her talking to you with Jake Topper in the background on CNN. Um, <laughs> Right now, because <laughs> we, uh, we've had a ton of fun with the Twitter part. And, yeah. and we, we bought this home uh, two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. It's about a 45, maybe 50 year old home out in the middle of the border between West Virginia and, you know, South America, basically. That's part of Orlando that we live <laughs> in. And we live on the West Virginia side, where it's a, it's a lot of, of real down home. What, uh, stereotypical country American folks, and uh, and we absolutely love it. But the house is on a lot of land, and it's on a couple of a lake and a pond, and and, it, and it's just nothing but work to do, and it's a, a labor of love for both of us. We we are literally like Caddyshack. We have lake, pond, and pool. So, <laughs> but, we all, but we always think pool is uh, pond is good for us. <laughs> yeah, you got you guys are killing it. I love your energy. I love your vibe. And uh, yeah, so you, you've got that big piece of property well documented again on Twitter. You got a, a par three project going up. Uh, how many holes yep. is that going to be? What, how, uh, right now we have three. Uh, well, we're trying to find the holes. We don't have real golf holes or flag sticks cups or anything. So we've used coffee cans. Yeah, uh, it's just a matter of how fast she drinks them. We have, we could, uh, we've, we've made in our minds a nine hole course with five greens with the ninth hole being a little 34 yarder to a green about as big as an iPad over water next to a flagpole. Yeah. So, yeah. But we have three greens that are currently being maintained, which makes for a six hole course and uh, baseballs and tee boxes cut out. And, and again, it's uh, four acres of land and, Three acres of it are taken up by the house and the pond. So you're, you're, you're carving it around that. It's mm. kind of like TPC sawgrass, actually. So who wins out of you two? What's going on there? Believe it or not, the first shot has yet to be struck. We're okay. too busy maintaining it. We're too busy being the ground staff. No, right you now. got painting to do. You got, uh, yeah. yeah, you got mowing. No, no. We, you got chores. Yeah. Can't wait to check yes. out the course records on Twitter, uh, you know, as this evolves, uh, assuming, you know, we don't have too much longer to go before we go on, on tour. So let's, I actually would love to switch gears into that. Mike Wan came out last week with uh, the new tour schedule updates. Um, how realistic in your guys' mind? Are you privy to any other information? Obviously, it seems like uh, the economy is opening up a little bit, but everybody's seems pretty divided. We haven't seen any sports go back. Uh, what's, what's, your, what's your view on the finishing the 2020 season and starting at the Dow? Uh, I mean, for, for my part, I think it very much depends on the next few weeks and, and how things go with, with the country opening up in general and, uh, and whether there is realistic opportunities for testing and things like that with regards to um, the players and caddies and everybody involved within the tournament as to how quickly things can get up and running. I'm pretty sure that most of the tours uh, would be a little bit concerned if, if they felt like they were taking tests away from, from the public yeah. uh, and people and first responders and people that really needed them first and foremost. So I, I think that there's all manner of things that need to happen first. I think Mike Wan is, is in a really good spot by pushing it back just a little bit farther than the, than the PGA Tour in that it gives him more time to, 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 to kind of see where all his ducks are. And, and he's got a really nice little schedule of events. Like fr from our perspective, looking at it, it's easy for us to drive to them. You know, we can go from one to another to another and it's, they, they've been nicely clumped together. Uh, all the tournaments have, have worked well in terms of, of placing their, their events in different spots and using, you know, how much daylight there is with, with locations and weather and all the rest of it. It's kind of uh, nice for him in, in, in that way. But I, I do think that there is a, an element of, uh, of unknown to, to a lot of it as to how and when things can, can get back up and running because I, I, it's, I, I just, we just don't know. There's so many unknowns with what's going to happen. I think so much of it depends in, in this next month what happens. But so um, the one thing that I, I've been around it, this is my ninth or tenth year covering the LPGA Tour. Um, the one thing I take full confidence in saying is that Mike Wan will make the right decision. Mm -hmm. And he'll, he'll have seen it long before anybody else sees it. So 
he he pushed it back a month, and I heard him speaking on uh, PJ Tour Network the other day with Michael Bree about the fact that he did that because he wanted to make sure, number one, that they could have the protocols in place. Number two, because you're asking people, if you're going to do a tournament in a month, you're asking people to get to work right now and to put money in place and to put resources in place and people to work, and they're not even in the office. They're at home. They're doing it through, you know, virtually. Um, and the fact that in doing so, in pushing it back a month from what he kind of hoped for, it didn't cost them a single tournament. They have dates for all of the tournaments in the fall. So if, if they do start at, and I think they will at the Dow, uh, Great Lakes Bay Invitational, if they do start there, um, it, everything will have been done right and for the right reasons, more importantly. Yeah, Mike Wan comes up uh, consistently over the last bunch of weeks in this podcast. I've never actually met him, uh, but uh, he sounds like a, a very thought out, and I've listened to all his podcasts as well, and uh, hi highly respected. And uh, yeah, I, I feel pretty confident about, uh, about the Dow as well, especially with the PGA Tour going ahead a month ahead of time. Uh, what about your thoughts? Obviously, Europe's a pretty big hot spot, and the the, the Evian, the British, and the Scottish are all still on the schedule. That mm. one kind of seems a little bit uh, questionable to me. Uh, any in, anything on that? Well, I, I can't. I, I don't know uh, what happens with, in in France with with Evian. I know that they've cancelled the, the the football in France, the soccer. Uh, that's pretty big for them to cancel soccer. Um, so I'm not sure how how a golf tournament would be viewed, and and I don't know how that works in France. I do know that in the UK. They are talking about putting the mandatory uh, two-week uh, quarantine on people flying into the UK. So if you fly into the UK, you have to quarantine for two weeks. So that would mean that anybody flying to the UK from here would have to get over there two weeks before those tournaments start. I think, I think that puts an issue. I think that that would put those tournaments in jeopardy more than anything else, regardless of whether they wanted them to go on or not. Yeah, it seems uh, one of my favorite quotes when people ask me, you know, hypotheticals is like, I don't live in the land of what if, but uh, we seem to be living in a whole lot of lands of what if right yeah. now. So, um, no, we're just excited to have a bit of a, a you know, a, a schedule talk. Um, we haven't really got into it much yet on this podcast and you guys being with Golf Channel and broadcasting, I think uh, it just plays a, a perfect role with that. Well, um, you know, looking at the new schedule, you said you can drive to it and we had uh, mm -hmm. we should have been we should have been rolling this conversation well before uh because we were having some <laughs> awesome offline talk um but ron and i uh met because we both drove the tour in rvs last year um is driving the tour it sounds like that's something that you're considering would it be in an rv or you're renting cars do you need any tips from ron and i basically what i'm getting at <laughs> i thought you and ron met online <laughs> uh, that's 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 what we didn't want people to know thanks jay <laughs> <laughs> he's good at that he's always good at giving away <laughs> um we we are definitely looking at driving it in fact i think that's no we are driving yeah we, we, we we're, we're gonna drive uh the, the question is whether we take the rv or whether we take jerry's truck is gonna be the big question um I that's have, even more I'm, time together that's a lot of it, time together luckily uh, he can put up with all my quirkiness. I, he's easy to put up with, but for me, not so much. I'm tough. No, that's yeah, exactly the opposite. No. Yes, you just need to speak louder because I'm old, <laughs> as Ron pointed out earlier. Um, no, the, uh, it, we, the, we have looked at the entire schedule, and mm -hmm. there's one time where we work seven straight weeks, another time where we do uh, four or five in a row, and we're not even guaranteed that we work we, – we, both work every event. That's not a given at all because there's a lot of commentators who need to get their work in um, because Golf Channel and uh, NBC Universal, Comcast, all of our parent companies are, are doing very well by their employees and doing the right thing even though it's not, uh, it's not cheap for them. So we're not, we're not, uh, we're fortunate in that we're not part of the, of the population that's suffering immensely during this. We're enjoying it and trying to provide a little diversion for those people uh, in the process. So there's a lot, we're not, we know that one of us will be working every single event um, that they have scheduled domestically. And if they are international, then we will travel those if it's safe. Uh, but we're, we're going to go, we're just going to hop, probably hop in the truck and, yeah. and pack it up, get a Yeti and, and go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's a stretch out in west. In the Yeti. <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's a stretch out west where Plenty there's like a 24 hour drives, four straight weeks. And, and one of them would be from Orlando to where you live, Casey. 
uh, in Vancouver to the uh, to the uh, CP Canadian Women's Open, yeah. and uh, and we're going to do it. It's number one. It's fun. We enjoy each other's company. We're a later yeah. in life couple who still happen to be in love, and uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon. No. And uh, and we enjoy it, and 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 it'll be fun. And we don't have to be there like you do. We don't have to be there Monday morning, yeah, ready to go. We 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 got to be there Wednesday afternoon for a meeting. So we have time to do it, and it's quite it's quite. It's quite nice because you know, looking at looking along the way and looking at, at our journeys, there are a number of friends that we've made during our time playing tournaments and and just from being around the tour uh, that we can stop that we would like to stop and visit on the way and uh, it's that'll be that'll be the fun part too. Like we'll stop overnight with our friends and and uh, talk and socially dis so, you know distantly from their spare rooms and uh, but it will be fun. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on that. Actually, that just resonated me big time, and we'll uh, maybe segue into Ron's uh, Ron's role on tour uh, with his venture because yeah, if you don't have to be there until you know, I guess Wednesday evening or something, mm -hmm. some of those jobs, uh, you know, if you get um, you know caddying, if you're in a late group on Sunday and you got to be there Monday, but Ron has it even worse because you know typically I would just go walk the golf course Monday afternoon so a 15 hour drive was you know no, not the end of the world but uh ron uh, does the luggage transportation for the women out mm -hmm. there on tour for those of you who didn't know that and so he's got a usually he's taken quite a few of the the big uh, big wigs bags and uh, at the end of the day he's there one of the last people there on sunday and he's got to be there monday morning ron can you talk about that a bit Oh, yeah, sure. I enjoy it, though. I, I pick up the girls' bags Sunday night, and last when the trophy presentation is over and I hit the road, hopefully get there uh, by Monday morning. These year, Monday's usually a travel day for all the girls, so we'll get there probably Tuesday, hopefully, but some of them I'll be pulling in Monday afternoon and dropping off the ladies' bag at the clubhouse, but it is a long haul. The one from Florida to uh, your part of the town, KCBC, is probably a good four, four and a half, five-day drive. <laughs> it's a long it's a long one depending because i don't go i'm usually about 64 miles an hour and i stop mm -hmm. a little bit um so i average about 50 miles an hour going there and it's 2700 miles or so from corner to corner it's a long one so i won't be doing luggage transportation there the girls will need their bags well prior to that but i love it out there it's it's, it's wonderful being inside the ropes and speaking of inside the ropes karen do you, would you rather walk the course with jerry on different holes broadcasting inside the ropes did you like the air conditioning trailer Ah, um, <laughs> Jerry's nodding over there on camera just for everybody uh, up to the air yeah. conditioning. It's, it's, an, it's an interesting prospect because I, I really like doing, doing both jobs um, because you, you get a really different perspective from, from both sides. When I'm on the course walking, uh, and, and Jerry can, can attest to this too, is that you're very much involved in that group that you're following. You're, you're seeing every single shot, you're watching the players' mannerisms, you're learning and picking up so much from what they're doing on the course that when I go into the booth, I have a much better base of knowledge to draw from, having followed some groups on the ground and watched them play. It's, it's quite fun for me in that regard to, to be out on the course and follow the groups. That being said, I love going into the nitty gritty and the analyzing and the how and the why and, and looking through the stats and trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. It's like, okay, why does, why is it that she's, you know, so good in this area, but not in this area? What is it? What, what's causing that? Why is all of a sudden her driving stats have gone downhill from, from where she was two years ago to where she is now? Or, or, or there are players that, that have stats that just maintain the same. And I'm like, I, they're not making any improvement. They're just being journeyman pros. They're, they're still doing good, but, not, not making that step to the next level that you'd expect them to make because they have enough talent, but their stats remain the same. Then you have other players, um, and, and I, I'm going to call out Marina Alex in this, who, whose stats have slowly improved every single year that she's played. She's made little slow improvements in every aspect of her game, and sure enough, she's gone ahead and won. And so, it, so, so you can tell from, from the players and, and looking at the numbers and where they are and and, you know, you can get inside their heads a little bit, you know, with, with that regard. So I love the puzzle um, of being in the booth, but I also love being on the ground because it's, it, you get to see them up close and personal firsthand and you don't see that in the booth. Uh, can, let me add a little bit to that. Um, she's a natural born analyst. She's great at both jobs uh, because she has one hell of a coach primarily. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Completely kidding. She's an absolute natural, Adam. But 
we'll be sitting there in the hotel room while I'm binge watching some useless thing on TV and she has her laptop out and two or three hours later, um, and maybe a, you know, 12 pack or so, uh, <laughs> for me, she'll, she'll, she'll just, she'll start talking. And then a half hour later, I'm like, well, I hope that makes the air tomorrow because that was brilliant. Cause you just practiced on me with your observations. <laughs> she sees things through the numbers that the only other person I know who sees is Brandel Chambly, who can look at the numbers and read into them and see things that you and I cannot see. And she has that firsthand experience of having played with a lot of them and having watched almost all of them in person as an on-course reporter uh, to, to bring a different perspective that, that I think makes her so revered in the industry. Aw, isn't he sweet? He is yeah. sweet. You, you are very all much in love still. That's, that's, that's beautiful. Beautiful right there. <laughs> Yes, the family um, at the Golf Channel on the LPGA Tour is it's such, I, I was lucky enough to walk inside the trailers and poke around and it's just so much fun. Everybody is having their rubbing shoulders with everybody. It's a family fun event. Judy mm -hmm. Rankin in the booth is wonderful. I think you're great oh. in the booth, Karen, because you do have the inside on the course. We don't get as much uh, information that you're giving us when you're in the booth. So I think the booth is a, a step up for, for us as a fan listening in. You're really hands-on about what's going on out there. But Judy's good. Kay Cockrell on the grounds is wonderful yeah. to listen to. You got, it's just a great family at LPGA, uh, the Golf Channel. Yeah, I mean, re really big heads up to, obviously, those are the, the people that you see. You know, those are the, those are the, 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 the figureheads of it. And Judy Rankin is, is obviously somebody who every, every female that's in sports could look up to with how she's gone about how, making her career in, in this business. But... Behind the scenes, there are a whole number of people that, that, that really matter more than we do. You know, we've got a fantastic producer in Beth Hutter, and she, she really goes above and beyond. Uh, you know, and, and it's just all of the people, you know, the graphics, the, the directors, the, the replay people, they all, they all play their part in putting on the show. And um, it's, it's fun to see how it all works, to be honest with you. Awesome, flatterly. Flatterly there, uh, Ron, I could learn a thing or two from the, the Silver Spox experience, uh, you know, Jerry as well. But uh, um, so I, I love stats, uh, Karen. I, you know, it's my oh. coaching background. I'm a, Ron's uh, experiencing my OCD uh, analyze <laughs> uh, uh, running a podcast with me. But um, you were um, a top 15, top 10 in driving distance pretty much your whole career, obviously a fantastic driver of the golf ball, um, some breakout years, uh, Solheim cup years, winning years. And from what I, mm -hmm. what, what I could see, obviously you're, you're, because you hit the ball so far, your greens and regulation are always going to be on the upper end, uh, if it's anywhere near the fairway. Um, but then on those yep. breakout years, you putted well. Um, yep. so, you know, a pretty deadly combination, obviously. Uh, and what's, I guess my question is, the men's game has so much talk about distance um, and how does that relate into the, the women's game? Like, you know, you got the, the Lexis, the Brooks, the Jutana Garns, et cetera. Uh, and they're all the bombers and they're all at the top. Um, you know, is there, do they, is there that big of a, um, an advantage to say the, the middle of the pack players just touch on that a bit? I, I think really, you know, you're, you're talking to a, a golf course design issue as much as anything else is that for the most part golf courses are designed to protect against the guys hitting it so far so you have a lot of a lot of the the trouble holes where you have maybe a, a, a water hazard will cut in at about 150 at the end of the fairway and then everything will really narrow up and get tight past that point towards the green from 150 and towards the green a lot of courses are designed with bunkers to to limit where people can drive the ball and things like that. And I think a lot of the, the design is, is to protect against the guys hitting it such a long way. But what they don't think about is, is the potential for women to hit the ball the long way and, and where it leaves them. Because ultimately, a lot of the times you see uh, a lot of the longer players uh, having to lay up off the tee. Granted, they're going in with a much shorter shot to the green. Like, you know, say a Lexi or an area we're going with a nine iron and you might say... You know, another player, you know, Lydia Co might be going in with a seven iron. Now that can make a big difference in regards how accurately you can go for a flag, how aggressive you can play. So that, that makes a big difference, uh, even though they're very limited with sometimes with where they can hit their tee shots. And I think that for the most part, the longer players struggle with patience uh, because you're, you're essentially taking one of the best clubs 
in their bag out of their hands. Um, and I know that I used to struggle with that. I used to find it very frustrating. I also know that if I was driving the ball well, the confidence that I used to feel with the driver used to run through every aspect of my game. So I think that the players who drive the ball a long way and far kind of are a little bit handicapped at times because they have to have to have to dial it back so much. It's yes, we've had a number of world number ones that have driven the ball a long way. You think of Annika, you think of Yanni Singh, you think of Lorena Ochoa. All of uh, the Sung Hoon Park to a certain extent as well, also, although not to the same extent as those three, I think, in terms of everybody else in the pack. Um, but you've also, you also got to look at Inby Park and, and Lydia Ko have also been world number one. Stacey Lewis, when she was world number one, she was probably, she was above average, probably nearer the top, the top sort of 20, 30% too. But it's, but there, it gives you a more, um, it's a much more level playing field, I think, on the LPGA for, for anybody to go ahead and, and perform well. I think if you're a short, if you don't hit the ball very far, I think that the chances of having a longer career are, uh, are less. Uh, I think it puts a lot of stress on every part of your game if, if you have to rely on your short game week in, week out. I think length, length adds for a long career. I think of LPGA players that have had long careers, Katrina Matthew, Julie Inkster, both of which were above average in terms of how far they drive the ball. So definitely a huge advantage, even in the women's game, for sure. Lexi, uh, it, it's really different on the LPGA Tour compared to the PGA Tour because, uh, now granted, there are guys who fly the ball 310, maybe 320 yards on the PGA Tour, and there's guys who fly it maybe 250. Um, and, but the courses don't prevent you from setting them up in that regard. But then you move the tees up a little bit on the same exact course, and you have Lexi and Van Dam who can fly at 275, 280, maybe even more at sea level before you get to elevation. Lexi who flies at 270. Uh, Area who hits a three wood, 265, 270 in the air. The three best drivers of the golf ball on tour, in my opinion, and maybe Sung Hyun Park. Um, but then you have players who literally fly the ball, major champions even, great players who might fly the ball with a driver 210, 215 yards. They're phenomenal athletes, phenomenal players, but they're not blessed with a great deal of club head speed. And when you're up on those front tee boxes for uh, forward tee boxes to a, compared to a men's event for on a course that was designed uh, with men members and, and men's golf in mind, you handicap a lot of the longer hitters on the LPGA Tour that you don't do in men's golf. And that's a, a huge, uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've watched Lexi in a round of golf all at her 18 holes and she'll maybe hit two or three drivers mm -hmm. um, and she's still leading because she can't hit it. There's no fairway for her to hit at because she's that much longer than the others. Um, the only golf course that's ever been designed with both female and male professional competition in mind was the Rio Olympics course by Gil Hansen. It was an absolute masterpiece was. built on a horrible piece of land and it was an <laughs> incredible masterpiece. Yeah. And uh, I, hopefully in time, we will see a little more of that as, uh, as women's golf being the, the fastest growing segment of the uh, golf audience and, and golf participation side of things. We'll see a little more of that taken into consideration through design. Yeah, I guess uh, um, reasons why you might not see like Aria even carry a driver, I guess it's just unnecessary. I guess from, you know, one of the hardest um, adjustments I had to make catting women's golf was uh you know because you do get up there and i guess the spin rate of an ann van dam is going to be different to some of those those other yep. uh, women out there you know when you're coming in with a nine iron as opposed to a, a seven iron but the spin rate was you know tough tough to adjust to as as being a you know a, a decently high level male player i'm like oh man the spin rate's just not there the ball's releasing it's coming in lower you can't go at that flag uh, you're just a, you it, it is it is a different game it is. If you caddy on the LPGA, you have to work really hard because you have to do pitch and rolls. You have to know how much the green, how, how much roll your player is going to get on any given green. Certain greens will release more. You pay attention to the greens book, not because you want to read the putt, but because of where you want the ball to land and knowing how the ball's going to react once it lands in that spot. If it's going to land on a slight downslope, if it's going to land on a slight upslope. You can use all those things to your advantage. And I, and I think that when you caddy on the LPGA, those are things that you pay far much more attention to than you would do on the PGA Tour. You have to worry about running through the fairways. You have to worry about carries. And, and there's all kinds of different things that, that come into play. Jerry, I mean, they're go ahead, Ron. I was just gonna, what's it like for you? You get to dip down to the, I call it the B League, the PGA. 
and watching you still go out there and work your craft out there. But what's yeah. it like between the men's and the women's tour? I know the distance is the biggest thing, but the crowd coverage, everything like that. It's uh, obviously the amount of information that we have to hand uh, when we're covering men's golf versus women's golf is, is very noticeable with the shot link and all the statistics that you have. You can draw so much information from, from what you see, see there and then. I think the guys play a game that is, uh, you, you just hit it and, then you, and, you, and they're so strong, they, they can pretty much deal with whatever kind of rough is in their place. And, and their short games have adapted because of that too. Like even though the flag may be cut on the, on the very much the short side of the hole and you, know, you might only have three yards to work with, they don't care. They're still going to go and attack that flag because they know that they've practiced and worked on their short game uh, to, to get to the point where they can still get up and down from that spot. They're just not scared of those. Whereas the women play have, have to play a much more strategic, tactical game around the golf course. The shots are no less impressive. The way they strike the drives, the way they strike a seven iron, the way they strike the wedges, so impressive. I mean, that's, it's, uh, it's interesting to watch them, how they tack their way around the golf course because that's how they have to play because they don't have that same kind of power. But they also, uh, ha they can't play uh, they don't play to those really tight flags. They will allow themselves a little bit more room because they're more accurate because they don't have the same club head speed as the guys do. So they, so they play a more accurate game of golf. And therefore, in my experience, I mean, I've seen some players with some fantastic short games, don't get me wrong, but I think the guys are slightly better with, with the way they get up and down around the greens because they put themselves in that position far more often because the women hit more greens in regulation. Um. Hard to argue with any of those points myself. Uh, the coolest part for me, uh, when I first started covering the LPJ Tour, it was about 50 50, because back then it was right after Mike Wan took over and the, and the schedule was pretty limited. So, and I usually do about 30 tournaments a year. So it's about 50 50. And then and, and, and obviously there's a difference in power, but there's a, a complete difference in approach to the game and precision and what have you between the two, which, which are obvious. You look at the numbers and it's absolutely obvious. Bomb and gouge or bash and barge, as my friend Wayne Grady says, on the PGA Tour and LPJ is about precision. But the coolest part for me through the years has, has been uh, the, now it's about three quarters women's golf and one quarter men's golf, or maybe somewhere in that vicinity for, for my uh, broadcasting schedule. The coolest part is when I go to PGA Tour events, how many of the guys come up to me, because I, I mean, I still know most of them, and the younger guys I get to know pretty quickly, come up to me and ask about the LPGA mm -hmm. players, much like the fans ask both of you guys everywhere you go when they find out you're associated with professional golf and women's professional golf. What's Lexi like? What's Aria like? What's so, you know, all that. The guys on the PGA Tour come up and ask me, tell me about her, tell me about her. Not from any kind of, any, any bad standpoint. They just want to know because they're watching a lot more and they're impressed. And, and they'll, they'll talk to me about the tournament that was on Sunday night when they were, you know, back at their hotel getting ready to travel to Monday's event. And they're watching the LPGA re-air mm -hmm. or maybe even live. And they're asking about this shot or that shot. And it's, it's really, really cool how big of fans many of the PGA Tour players have become in women's golf in the last decade or even more importantly, the last five or six years. It's, uh, it, it's really neat. And I, I think the time has come where there is a, a big mixed team event. Uh, to come back, not just a ceremonial one, not not something that comes in the offseason, but a big mixed team event that uh, that means a lot because it, the time is right in our culture, the time is right uh, politically, and the time is right from a fan standpoint. Yes, I, I love I, the mixed team events. Casey actually got to participate. He was over there caddying when they had the mix, and I asked him about it. But I'd love to see the women, guys, women, guys, every alternating foursomes or threesomes on the same course, playing in the same conditions. I still stand the test. I think the women's will hold their own. And they were up there pretty close last time. A couple girls were up under 10 under par. Winner was about 14, I believe. But I'd love to see that too. On the same day, same conditions, women play, I'd say 10% different tee box than the guys and, and see how they stack up at the end of the day. I, well, I don't, I don't know if that's the actual the, the number that it would be, but I, but I have a, I have a, a dream of, of a golf tournament that would be women and men play, the, play a golf course um, at where, the, where they set up with the same clubs into the green. So if the average guy's going into the green with an iron arm, the, the average women's going into the green with an iron arm too. So, so if you can set up a golf course where they're playing into the greens with the same club, 
I think you can play for one person, one trophy, and just see who goes ahead and wins. The, the Vic Open that you're talking about, Ron, and also the Golf Sixes over in Europe, those are incredibly well received from the fans from a TV standpoint, which obviously is, is our industry and what we care about uh, promoting. Um, and, and I think there is a huge future for something like that. It just takes sponsors getting involved and a few egos getting out of the way. Yeah, I love to see it. And I love the fact the Golf Channel has done such a great job in the last few, maybe 10 years, to bring in the LPGA on prime time, even if it is tape delayed sometimes. But so much more air coverage the last 10 years on the LPGA. I just love it. You know, I think the girls are equally as talented as the guys, and I'd really like to see more um, mixed events just like that. Well, and I, I think, you know, with the new with the new deal and everything else, I think you'll get to see see more of the women women play, to be honest. I, I think that there is a general a, a, a good interest in, in watching, to be honest, right now. Yeah, and I'm just Jerry. gonna just gonna touch on that a little bit more for people who don't uh, know what we're talking about. Just the Vic Open in Australia is a, an event where the the European tour, the men's play, uh, they coincide with the women and they go uh, tea time, tea time adjacent to each other. And it's uh, from, from, from everybody out there on the driving range to all the players, they think it's just so unique. And right down to the, uh, the, the, the patrons, um, there's no ropes anywhere and they're allowed to walk anywhere on the fairway and it doesn't really become too much of an issue. And I was actually chatting um, to this to some people I was playing with the other day. They were, like you said, work for the LPGA. They were hounding me on questions and, uh, um, yeah, just a, a really, really neat experience being, well, inside the ropes, but there are no ropes. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I'd love to see more of that. Uh, you know, there's some logistical uh, difficulties, uh, but nothing that, uh, nothing that they can't make uh, turn around and, and turn into, like, a, a huge marketing thing for sure. I, I think certainly from, you know, when you look at the biggest perspective, the, the, US, the US Open uh, in 2014 was held at Pinehurst. You had the, the men play the week before the women play. And I think that really uh, opened a lot of people's eyes as to um, how competitive the women can play on the golf course, how you can set up the course. The USGA did a tremendous job in finding information from, from the caddies, from the guys, um, what their players were hitting into the greens. And so they were set up the golf course accordingly for the women. So it was very interesting watching how the guys played it and then rolling through into watching the women's play mm -hmm. the following week. And, uh, and then Augusta last year. Yeah. Augusta National Women's Amateur with Jennifer Cupcho and Maria Fossey battling down the stretch and making eagles on par fives and hitting shots that we're used to seeing during the Masters week, which uh, subsequently was the following week at Tiger One. Um, that was that that probably did more for what we're talking about to promote the cause than any single day in the history of golf because it was awesome to see the 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 patrons as you said, Casey, and it applies so well at Augusta. <laughs> the patron reaction to women playing Augusta National was, was as it should be at every event. Well, yeah, the that LP was a beautiful day. The LPGA is uh, one of the biggest women's sports brands in the world. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge brand, a huge logo, and it's clearly evolving. You've been both commentating around the game for so long. Like, how do you see the brand? Obviously, it's a global brand coming out of this pandemic and like, you know, obviously by the helms of Mike Juan, like, is it just gonna, is it gonna be stronger and just, you know, come out on the other end? Um, what, what's your thoughts there? I think uh, a number of things come into play. Um, in terms of leadership, I don't think you could ask for a better leader for, for the tour. I think that, yeah. um, you know, he, he's the right person for the job at all times. And I hope he stays until he, he's, you know, he, he just decides, you know, in 30 years from now, his wife Meg says, okay, we're done with this. We need to move on. Um, but, you know, he's truly brilliant at, at what he does, truly cares about the players first and foremost. And he cares about the sponsors and, and the, the fans. And he just has a really good uh, empathetic streak to him. That he, just, he just understands what everybody's feeling. And I think that is very unusual when you get to, to being at the very top of, of the sports world. Um, so I think in that regard, it's in a good place. I, I think a lot remains to be seen how everybody comes out of this pandemic uh, economically wise. I think there's so much that is, is unknown with regards how, how companies 
uh, work out from that and how the sponsors themselves, how that pans out. But I, I do believe that um, the LPGA suffered huge amounts in 2008, um, a number of which was obviously not because Mike Guan was there. But when he came on board, he really turned things around and, and made it happen. And I think that with him in charge, I think the LPGA has a really great opportunity to ride through this storm and come out the other side doing okay. The only way I want Mike Wan to not be commissioner of the LPGA Tour, and I speak, I mean, granted I'm supposed to be unbiased, granted I'm supposed to be a reporter and do this and that, but I'm also a fan. I'm a fan of golf. Mm -hmm. I watch golf all the time. Um, the only way I want Mike Wan to not be commissioner of the LPGA Tour is if he decides to run for president, because I, <laughs> I think the guy would I think the guy would have a chance to win. I honestly think he would have a chance to win. Remember when they were searching, when they were going to replace Carolyn Bivens, and they did this search for the next commissioner, the, the executive committee of the LPGA, the, the board. Um, Mike Wan wasn't, nobody knew who he was. Nobody knew who he was. And he went in there and sold them on himself. And it was the greatest decision they ever made. Granted, 99% of Americans might not know the name Mike Wan, but in, in 10 minutes of listening to him on TV, you'd vote for him. You'd, you'd march, march over hot coals for it, mm -hmm. for the cause with that guy leading. He's, he's an incredible person. I'm proud to call him a friend, and I hope he's the LPGA commissioner until he decides to run for president. Yeah, very well said. I've seen him out on tour a few times. Very nice, pleasant guy comes up to you and says, hello, I know Casey's got a bromance with him. He just thinks the world of him. And <laughs> Mike Wan has bringing the game globally if there's a pandemic you know he's got it covered if one country goes under financially he's got his way around that country they bring us to another country the tv market share that he's brought they broadcast lpj 134 mm -hmm. uh, countries are broadcast he's just doing a wonderful wonderful job another great thing that that started i which i love is um drive chip and putt at augusta five years ago and that is the fastest growing the girls the young girls 38 percent up each year going forward every time in the LPJ getting the publicity we're getting now just means more little girls seeing the big girls out there they're just loving life and I can't wait to see what the LPJ has in store in the future it is it is amazing when you when you you're inside the ropes at LPJ tournaments and you, and you take a glance around to 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 look at, at the gallery and who's watching that the amount of young kids that are there watching not just little girls but little boys too their, their dads bring them out to watch it's just a really good experience for them because it's not as crowded it's not as packed you have a very polite crowd you don't get the rowdy mashed potato crowd um <laughs> on the lpga and it's just a, i know it's just a really nice environment to take kids to and i mean let's face it who doesn't want something to do with their kids Oh, it's a great environment. Even walking down the fairway, I've been a fan for years. Yeah. My first LPGA event was 1979, Rancho Park in Los Angeles. But I literally, we're walking down the 18th at the Kia Classic. I brought a friend who's never been to an LPGA tournament. We're walking down with, um, oh, I forget the player now, but we reached over and said hello. We saw her the next week at a and and she remembered my friend Jean. Um, Catherine Kirk said, remembered my friend Jean from the Kia Classic. He's now an LPGA fan. He watches nothing but LPGA. The interaction you get between the holes, you can high five the girls. The guys give you, they don't even give you eye contact. The girls are tossing balls, tossing gloves. Lexi's given up shoes before. I've seen her do that. The, the mm -hmm. fan experience at an LPGA is second to none. And I just love being out there inside or outside the ropes. Fan yeah. till the end. I, uh, I've, I've had this conversation so many times, you know, and so Karen and I kind of maintain a relatively active uh, Twitter, um, Twitter in interaction with with people who follow golf, and every once in a while, uh, all too often, you get the you get the idiot um, who you know lives in mom's grandma's basement who <laughs> hasn't actually seen the trolls. The trolls. the trolls. Yes. They call them trolls. I don't even know what a troll technically is, but <laughs> those people. That's those what a people, troll is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and they say that, and and I I am always the guy. I don't block them or cuss them out. I'm always the guy to to kind of you know, poke the fire a little bit, see what's going at it. And I'll tell them every single time, you, if we come near you, if the LPGA Tour comes near you, you'll be my guest. I will get you tickets. I'll get you a parking pass. I will bring you out onto the golf course. I'll bring you out of the range and introduce you to players. And if you're not a fan of the LPGA by the end of that, then, you, then you're absolutely beyond hope. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beyond hope. I'm going to test. He actually does that. It, ha <laughs> it does happen. 
I, I'm uh, a, a taken back by yeah, quite a few of the 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 girls that I've got to, the women that I've got to work for. Um, you know, Kelly is at, Kelly Tan, my my current employer, is exceptionally wonderful. But I worked for uh, Christy McPherson at the Dow last year, and oh she wow, she was like from going all year with with a rookie. You know, granted, you know that they they're just not into that atmosphere yet. But oh my. God, that Southern hospitality. She was inviting the kids inside the ropes on practice rounds. I was like, this is like a phenomenal, like just for, for me to watch as somebody who's grown the game their whole life as a, as a PGA member and coach, I was like, she, th- she is embodying like the spirit of growing the game and like passing it along, along to the, the young, the young, they were, they were boys and girls out there. And it was just, uh, that was, that was a standout moment. Shout out to, to Christy and, and what she was doing out there. But she's awesome. making an impression in those kids' lives. You know, she, she's, she's making an impression into how, in how to go about and do things too. You know, it's, it's like Mike Wan, when he first came on board, he said, act like a founder. That's exactly what the founders did. When I was uh, a very young man, I grew up in Las Vegas, in Nevada. And uh, my dad was a golf nut his whole life, which is how I got started in golf. Um, I was probably 10, 8 or 9 or 10 years old, and they had the Las Vegas Invitational, of course, called Sierra Nevada. And um, I went out with my dad because he told me he happened to knew this guy named, uh, happened to know this guy named Al Besseling. I, I, my dad worked in casinos. He was a dealer and a box man and eventually a floor man. So maybe Al gambled at his table. It didn't look like they were great friends, but we were out there, and Arnold Palmer, probably 71 or 72. Um, Arnold Palmer is hitting balls on the range. And I stood there and I was mesmerized, not only by the sound of the ball when he hit it, which is like, you know, nothing I'd ever heard before as a kid at a Muni golf course. Um, and, and, and he saw me standing there and, and he, he saw my dad, you know, proud dad with his son who wants to be a golfer and really loves the game. And he motioned me up and I sat, it was Sunday. It was Sunday before the play. And he motioned me up to sit right there. I sat under the rope. Now on Sunday, of course, as you guys know, the practice tees all the way back at the rope. So I'm sitting under the rope. The only, the only thing between me and Arnold Palmer is about six feet, maybe five feet. And he's hitting two irons and all these thousands of people are gathered behind me. And who's this kid? He, he, What's a two he, iron? I know exactly. <laughs> and he's taking these divots that look like dollar bills are about as, as, as thick as a sheet of paper and just flushing it. And every once in a while, he would give me a nod, give me a wink and say, how was that? And I probably watched him for 25, 30 minutes before he went out to play. And the, the point of the whole story is, I'll remember that and remember that person uh, for the rest of my life. And so many of the LPJ players create those memories week in and week out, day in and day out, uh, that go so far uh, to promoting the game, to promoting everything that we won't see the benefits from for years. Yeah, just a quick, quick touch on that. Really, really amazing story. And we had Gabby Lopez on the show a few weeks back. And, and she said, Lorena Ochoa did that to her when she was a kid walking in the ropes. And something that she wants to do is continue to do that to kids. Because even though Lorena didn't know it at the time, like that had driven Gabby to, you know, pursue what she's been pursuing to this day. So really cool. I've, I've played with Lorena uh, on a number of occasions. And... Honestly, there, there is no bigger heart in the game than hers. I mean, it's, it, it's sad. In many, I'm really happy for her, don't get me wrong, to, to go and live a great life, have kids. And, but I missed her out on tour because of her personality, the way she interacted with people, how she would always give back. And boy, did she ever take my money when we, when we played. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, such good this is great content you guys absolutely phenomenal I swear we're cognizant of your time here um, I've really got a few more questions I don't know how Ronnie's doing over there but uh, I guess that's a good uh, place to segue into um, you know so we're on this big break and I just I'm wondering if the break you know like who does the break help or hurt um, obviously we already kind of just came off an off season but a lot of players haven't had a start for the year even because um there's the tournament of champions florida and then australia and a lot of the big wigs kind of make their their start in those uh those asian swing where there's yep. a, a smaller field uh, so who does this hurt who does this help is it just going to be like a free-for-all and everybody's going to be chomping at the bit and every field's going to be maxed out with the best is every field going to be a major field at the beginning yeah i think so i, I think everybody's going to be ready to go they're going to feel a great deal of pressure to, to get the job done early 
uh, because ultimately you don't know how many opportunities. I mean, there's so much that's up in the air with the Aussies, and there's so much that's up in the air. I think any chance the players get a chance for a start, it's it's a chance for them to make money to to pad their bank accounts because not everybody has a nice little cushion in there from sponsorship money. And and I do think though that the players that have sponsors that that are financially more set that have an advantage, they can go in and be a little bit more chill with regards to the whole situation. Um, I, I think that the, it will benefit the players that were maybe a little burnt out. So, so you've got maybe players that have gone seven or eight years on tour that was really ready for a little bit of a breather, but because of the pace of things, it's hard to, to sit back and rest. Uh, this has given them a chance to, oh, to decompress a little bit, to, to work on some things in their game that they'd really like to, to come out feeling fresh again and ready to go because it can be, the, the grind can be really hard. And so to have, have an opportunity, and, and I like to call it an opportunity. Yes, it's, it's tough to call this an opportunity, but in the mind of a golfer and somebody that's trying to compete, you have to see this as an opportunity because it's the only way that, that you're going to come out of this, the, the other side, looking, you know, feeling good about things. As an opportunity to maybe work on a few things, to get that rest and recuperation that you need. Um, if you have a bit of money behind you, then it's going to, be quite plain sailing and you'll just sail right through it and it'll be good if you don't and if, if you've been struggling that the likelihood is is that you could put yourself under far too much pressure those first few weeks and and you may not and you may not succeed uh, there will be a number of players like Jerry um, who when his back was up against the wall uh, at SQ schools he was able to perform and play well there's a number of players like that on the LPGA that could uh, potentially do well, but I, I do think that the, the, the most the players with the most financial security but behind them will be the most chill about yeah, everything. There are a lot of factors involved, as Karen touched on many of them, and, and the and the motivation personally, be yeah. it financial or or what have you, um, is going to be a big part of it. But to me, I see it a little differently. To me, the difference is going to be if you see a player who has her coach on a week in and week out basis on the practice tee on the LPJ tour in the past. They're going to struggle. If you see a player who shows up and hits a great, like Alexi Thompson mm -hmm. or Aria Jutanagarn or the, or the Corda sisters who don't need a coach out there, even though they all have coaches, they don't need a coach out there, um, that fall out of bed hitting it in the center of the club face. I, I predict, um, honestly, one of those four, and I'm leaning towards Lexi for a different reason, but leaning towards Lexi to have a breakout fall. If we start in July and end in December, that Lexi will be player of the year just because she's such a naturally gifted athlete, the only thing that hinders her at times is her putting. Uh, and, and, and Casey hit on a great point earlier. When you hit it that good, you're not going to make as many putts. You're going to hit more greens and not make as many putts. Um, but those, those, she's got a rest from those demons that, that kind of creep in there. And I think Lexi will be uh, in, in the conversation for player of the year if we play July through Dece December. And, and so many players like that. I mentioned Aria. I mentioned the Corda sisters, but there's, there's a number of other ones out there who are authentic players who don't need somebody looking at everything they do to tell them what they're doing wrong, take ownership of it and go out and get it done. You kind of answered my next question there, but I think my, I think my country a woman, Brooke's going to, you know, have a thing to, to talk about Lexi to uh, another great example. Another, another... I'm, sorry I missed that. I'm sorry. I missed that. Another great example. And one of the finest people on the face of the earth. Um, yes. She, she, she literally does not need to practice, although she plays every single day of her entire life. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, there's, it, so my question was gonna be like, who is your breakout player for 2020? Um, Jerry hit us with it, with Alexi or, or one, one of those gals. What, a, uh, what about you, Karen? It's so hard, so hard to say. Kelly Tan. <laughs> Kelly Tan. Kelly Tan, That's based on her caddy. Um, <laughs> that's what I like to. That's what I like to think. <laughs> uh, it's hard to imagine Jin Young Ko not having another great year. I, I, I she's just too solid. I, it's always really hard to follow up such a great year with another one, and, and typically it hasn't happened. But she handles it so well, in much like Annika Sorenstam did. I, I think um, now that the Olympics are not happening this year, I think maybe MB Park might cool off a little bit, but I, I was fully expecting MB Park to have a huge year, given that the Olympics were, were about to kick off. Danielle Kang is a player that has been trending in, uh, mm -hmm. in the right direction. Um, so there are so many, so many players. I think that 
the, the one player that we would all like to see, uh, well, in fact, there's probably two players that we would like to see um, regain some of their old form. One would be Lydia Ko. I think we would love to see her back at the top of the game because it's better when she's there. Uh, it's more interesting. The way she, way her, way she uses her, her short game to, to control her scores is, is pretty fantastic. And the other player that, that I'd like to see come back to some kind of form, just because she's so exciting to watch, is Yanni Seng. Ah, that's a bit of a stretch. It is a stretch <laughs> because she's had such, such a tough, tough bit of she, time. But, but, but you can't be that good and struggle. I, I mean, it, I don't see her ever being what she was, but I, I think that if she can gain a little bit of confidence back, I, I, she was always exciting to would, me to it watch. It would be one of the greatest sports stories uh, overall of this generation if she could come back to a, a number one position in the world because she was, she was so much better than everybody else mm -hmm. when she was a dominant number Off one. the charts. Off good. the charts, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that, seeing that, uh, you know, uh, Karen and Jerry uh, uh, back and forth there about that being, a, that being a stretch. But, you know, Karen, that's just the, that's her, her, her golf in her blood, her analyzer, her she's been a player, you know, and just like, you know, feel, funneling into the, the, the feel-good story and like what, what's yeah. going to make for good TV, good fan watching, and just what the tour yeah. could, could use for sure. So. It's so easy to, to forget if, you, if you've just come into LPJ Golf the last, say, three or four years, how good Yanni Seng was. I mean, my goodness. I mean, she had everything. She hit it a mile she made pucks and she had, she, I mean, she was exciting to watch. I joked with her caddy one time after about the third year, right before she kind of fell off the map. I joked with her caddy. I'm like, I said, I've seen more shots that she's hit than you have in the last three years. Cause I watched her literally every single round of golf. She was in the premier Thursday group. Somehow we'd, we'd fit her into half of our schedule on the Friday uh, air times. And then Saturday and Sunday in the last group, every single week and she couldn't have been more gracious with her time the entire time she was she was she's just a she's a rare person a very rare person obviously we like to hear uh hear the 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 great players being great people as well um i guess my last and final question uh, and i'll let ronnie take it from here is uh well we know who to look out for in 220 2020 and, and who we want to you know who, who are who we, we see succeeding, but what about the hangover from 2019? Who's going to have the hangover? Who had a great year last year and might, uh, might stumble? I lead, I lead in strokes game hangovers. Just so <laughs> you know, in this house. I see the, uh, the drinks you've been pouring over there, Jerry, on the old Cinco de Mayo. And just for the listeners, this will be a delayed broadcast. But uh, yeah, so spe <laughs> speaking of hangovers, not Jerry Fultz's hangover, but uh, yeah, just, uh, just players, if, if you wouldn't mind. I know you're analysts on the Golf Channel and don't want to speak of anybody's talents, but if, 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 you, if you can't touch on that, that's no problem as well. It's a really, that's a really tough one. I mean, I... I mean, I, the, the, obviously the person who led last year, Jin Young Ko, I've just tipped to, to continue with that kind of form. Like she's one of those few people that I do think you, you can go right ahead and, and continue down that path. I'm not so sure that there's, that there's anybody. And, and I, think, I think the fact that you've had this break is really helping those top players because it's given them a amount of, an, an amount of time to just relax, just to chill a little bit and not roll fresh out into another season. It really does feel like a fresh start, like a fresh season, as opposed to just a continuation of something that's already happened. So I think that you might just see a continuation of the top players from last year just jumping right back on into, into where they left off. I think players that have had some injuries, um, they've had an opportunity now to, to have them heal and to, to get better too. It's, it's, it's quite a... a a different situation for these players to be in. But I, I, I'm not so sure that anybody, I, I can't really figure out a bit of a, of a bad hangover. Um, no, I, I, I don't see. MJ Her, bit of a tough one to follow up. She had a, MJ Her had a great year last yeah. year. But oh, sure. What about, like, is, Lee, is Lee Six going to follow up on her rookie uh, campaign ah, with another ah, great year? Wow. Good US cool. Open winner. It, was leading, it was a leading question. Yeah. And we didn't catch it. I get it. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. That's a good point. She that, was already starting to fall off a little bit at the end of the season. And she didn't but have we, a great start uh, in Australia or no. uh, Florida. So, 
We, um, you know, and, and you guys, you've been around, you've followed it for a while. You've been in the golf industry for a long time, Casey and Ron. You've been, you've been a golf fan your whole life, and you're my age. So um, we've seen the lead sixes of the world's come and go to very little fanfare after, after you know, for a flash in the pan here and there. Um, having been around her, having watched her play, she has the skills to be able to maintain a, a, an elite level of play for a long time. But every year we get another couple dozen of players with that same skill set and a lot more hunger. So we'll see. Well, time will tell. But that's a, that's a, great, that's mm. a great point. That's a, I, I didn't even think about that one. Yeah, but that she like she it. could she could just be you know a, a a a player in two or three years that remember when I, I don't think she'll be that but you never know because she's like Karen said she she kind of was trending in that direction before the pandemic started. U.S. So the U.S. Women's Open can sometimes produce some random winners, and you know with her in that category, I mean you, I mean obviously yes, you know there's been a few you know. Uh, Hillary you should have won that one. Karen should have won at Cherry Hill. I should. I was in the final group. Um, I was playing with Morgan Pressel right. and uh, watched the the hole out from Birdie Kim. Uh, but I digress. But you know, Hillary Lunky, another another player. That the, the U.S. Women's Open has produced some uh, some unusual winners. And Jenny Chesirapor, who lost in a Monday playoff. Yeah, to Siri Puck, who's a college coach now. Yeah. yeah. So so it's like it, it doesn't guarantee you success. Um, she's obviously a very consistent player, and very much of it depends on on uh, these few months that she's had off, as, and how she sees herself in the big scheme of things. Because obviously she's up against Jin Young Ko, and, and the one thing I do know, and you would know too, from being out on tour, is that um, the the Korean players are very competitive amongst each other uh, in all manner of of respects. It's not just about competitive uh, on the with with the tour in general. It's amongst themselves. It's uh, it can be quite tough. Let me let me raise a almost a, almost a, a a kind of a Pandora's box of question though. Um, culturally, and nothing more than culturally, not racially, but culturally, the Korean players and many of the Asian players, but mostly the Korean players, uh, rely on, on repetition for greatness. Yeah. They practice harder. A simple way of saying it: they practice harder. And right now. That's not going to be the case. I don't care where you live in the world. You're not practicing a ton. No, I think that... You're disagreeing? I am. I am. I were, I, I'll intervene because I actually uh, coached golf in China for an entire year. So I'm m more than familiar with the, uh, the Asian practice culture. And I, it is every coach's dream over there, but also the nightmare because... Um, it is, it is, and I mean, I'm speaking with China, but I know it's, you know, similar territory. The, the amount of hours they throw in on those repetitions is substantial, mm -hmm. almost to the point of like bandering, you know, battered, all I saw was battered wrists. Um, obviously these women are at the top of their game. So scoring on the golf course, but I would have to ban kids from the driving range and like make them go on golf course. And like, it's, it's, it's another realm over there. So I, I, I yeah. don't think that hurt, you know, it, it can hurt people. I want to hear your 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 my, your, your contort to my supposition. Uh, my my contort is that everybody works hard on the LPJ tour. In order to make it on tour, you're, you're you've worked hard, but in order to to have the level of success that a lot of the Korean players have, you it requires a level of discipline. Not only with what you practice, how you practice, but how you pick your targets, how how you handle yourself on the golf course how you go about your business in general. And I, I think that, in, that they are emotionally disciplined when it comes to everything that, the, that they do. And it's, and it's um, whereas for, for me as a player, I, can't, I can only speak for myself. For me as a player, I hit a bad shot. And if I get sufficiently angry enough, it's going to affect my next shot because right. I'm going to try and be over aggressive. I've seen it. I've seen it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to try and be over aggressive to make up for it. I'm going to try and pull off the miracle shot. I'm going to try and go for a flag that I have no right going for. And if I don't do it on that hole, I sure as heck I'm going to do it on the next hole or the next hole or wherever. I'm going to try and make the putt for par and end up running it three, four foot pass and then miss the next one and make a bogey. That's how, or double bogey, that's how things go. Whereas for a lot of these, for a lot of players that the top players from, from Korea, they don't do that. 
they are very target disciplined. They, they pick a target, they stick to the target, they move forward, they, they go with the shot that they're supposed to play. They don't let that emotional pull influence what happens. But, but and I got it now. Because everybody practices hard. Yes, this really no matter, has been. No matter, no matter where you're from, everybody disagree. practices hard. But when, when basically, like I mentioned earlier, with Lexi, the Corner Sisters uh, area, and a few others, and Brooke, of course, too. Um, when you come back out of this in July, say we get to go to the Dow mm -hmm. in July and then marathon the week after, are you going to pick the player with the most mental discipline who needs a ton of repetition? Or are you going to pick the player who falls out of bed, hitting it on the center of the club face, uh, who might be an emotional player? I'm with all Jerry. Right, so, 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 all right. So, uh, all right. Go ahead. Here's, I'm with here's, you. Here's, okay. So here's another avenue that we should look well, at. Well, it is. It no, is, no, no. Stop, stop. <laughs> So, so here's, another, here's another avenue. A lot of the players from Asia have grown up just hitting balls on the driving range, right? Driving range, lots of Absolutely. net Absolutely. In, inside. Lots, of indoor, lots yep. of indoor work. So Young Yu told me she never had to hit a shot out of a tree before she came to America. What, what have people had, not had access to, a lot of people in this uh, stay at home? They've not had access to golf courses, but they have had access to a net and a mat in their in their house or their bedroom yeah Much but karen like what they were used to you sorry i just totally cut you off there but you and i both know that's not golf and you know like I, no. uh, you know just just a great i mean whatever this is conversation at its finest so <laughs> i i guess i <laughs> but classic uh difference of opinion but uh yeah i mean anybody can sit there and work on those positions but i mean those are perfect environments perfect lies and yeah. i think all the girls rolling out of bed kind of have that uh, as well so i'm just gonna i'm gonna go and i'm gonna go with jerry on this one for sure oh, for sure man. another win another yeah. win what about so you ronnie good. who are you going with come on ronnie yeah no i i believe it's the person who's got the talent whoever's got the talent practice 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 you can go away from the game you come back you haven't swung a club i just did it the other day shot a real good back nine after not hitting the ball in two months so it's just the, the practice, yes, practice is there. It comes down to the short game. Whoever's practicing their putting, everybody can hit long and chase it and find it. Whoever's got that short game, the, the chip in green in their backyard, I'll put my money over there. I think we're going to see boy. some phenomenal golf. Whatever it is coming out, of the, coming out to start the year, it's, it's going to be that, unreal. That I agree with. By the way, I know we're winding down, but I, I must say one thing uh, to the listeners because they can't see us. It, uh, and you might not know who Ron Dunn is, but to see him with a mullet at 58 years old is very, very impressive. It's a, it's a really nice mullet. We'll throw this up on YouTube uh, so, uh, so everybody can, uh, yeah, there'll be some <laughs> the promotional video coming out on this. So Ronnie's Silver sure. Fox mullet's going to be. Hey, no uh, problem. Uh, <laughs> no problem. I'm proud of this is my COVID-19 look right now. Guys, <laughs> that's in last. Yeah, speaking of fans and everything, when they do let us back in, I'm gonna put my fan hat on in a minute. How big is the bubble? Who's gonna get to go out there? Parents, coaches, fans. You know, I'm, I work kind of. I, I'm a rep for a couple products. Am I gonna be able to be out there on Thursday? The parents. It, it depends on the market and the legislation in place at the time, according yeah. to Mike Wan. Yeah, some places will have a, a pretty pretty solid fan experience with social distancing being a huge part of it, but other places might not have much uh, fan involvement. And the really, the really cool thing is a little bit of a sidebar to that is, is the tournaments that weren't able to hold tournament, uh, their, their scheduled events this year, many of those title sponsors have put their money back into the current tournaments Amazing. so that the, the ladies can play for more money and that they can support uh, women's golf and, and the cause even more. And of course, the benefiting charities in those communities. Um, it, it's a pretty amazing environment on the LPJ tour. Yeah, it was yeah, wonderful but, to see that the pur purses are all picked up this year. A lot of ones that aren't showing, they're putting their money somewhere else. They got to spend it somewhere. So it's good to see that the purses are getting bigger. And they've been getting bigger for the last few years. The women played for, I think, 70 million last year on tour. So we're definitely getting up there. I think yep, the exactly. average purse this year when we go back is uh, $2.3 million, which is uh, a, lot of, a lot of prize money. So hopefully things to come in the future, assuming the uh, global economy can bounce back from this. Um, that last question um, was certainly a Pandora's box. Uh, <laughs> if, if we, like Jerry said, if we have had one on this show. So we really, really appreciate the back and forth. And um, you know, I, I think we've, that's a really good place to kind of wrap it up as well. We've gone, you know, 
an hour, 20, 25 minutes or something like that. And just phenomenal okay. content. And you guys have been absolutely fabulous. Uh, Ron, do you have anything else for them? Yeah, just a couple more things. My fan hat again. Jerry, when I see you getting the, the signals flashing from the caddies and everything, that I kind of know a little bit about it. But give me some of the – what are the wedges signs for the wedges? <laughs> You've been talking to Benji Thompson, haven't you? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Oh, yeah, he has a unique uh, sign for the gap wedge. Um, uh, none, nonetheless, uh, it, it, if you give me two fingers, it doesn't matter which direction it's held. It's a seven iron or a two iron. Now, if you're 160 yards from the hole, that's obviously not a two iron if anybody carries a two iron. On the way down, you know, the three is an eight or a three iron. On down to nine. Full fist is a pitching wedge. Gap wedge, we try and coach people to look to point at their hat for a gap wedge because in the day, the Golf Channel hat had a G on it. So that was the gap wedge. Sand wedge, you just draw an S in the sky. And a lob wedge is... Uh, like the, the the epiphany of my career, it's an L sign, loser sign, right on the right on the forehead. Yes. All right. Yeah, I've, I've seen you guys have interacting a lot. And speaking of interactions, uh, you've been around the game for a while with some of the caddies like T Mac, Greg Johnson, Paul Fusco. You got any good stories about them? Hmm. Uh, uh, plenty. Uh, and much like the stories that they have about us and the players, we can't really say them publicly. Paul Fusco. Uh, is is one of my favorite new caddies for uh, for Se Young Kim, um, I, and I, I've said this on TV last year during the Meta Heal. I said it's when he's out on the course, it's like he's watching a movie only he can see. He is in his own world out there, and it's hilarious. We were at Lote a year, just over a year ago now, like 53 weeks ago, and the rules officials had to get a flag stick replaced in the final round because Paul put it in backwards. He ripped the flag off. He was so into what she was doing that he put the flag in the actual cup itself. Oh, wow. uh, he's one of my favorites. He, uh, he, he is the most loyal to his player uh, that I know. Well, all of them are, for that, most of them are, for that matter. Um, he's never looking for another job. And, he, and he's, he looks out for his player more than anybody I know. Mm -hmm. And he looks out for us just as much, which we appreciate. Sorry about the dog bark. Um, but, there, you know, there's, a, there's probably – 20 or 30 caddies out there that I put in in the top of the echelon of caddy ranks worldwide men's and women's golf the caddy on the LPGA tour because they love it and because they're good at it and they and they, they have they have great back Greg Johnson is another one of them of course T Mac Terry McNamara who has 80 something wins worldwide mostly with Annika um, and there's a number of others and many have, have gone on to successful PJ tour bags someone like uh, Brian Dilly um, who now makes a ton of money out on the PGA Tour, who caddied for Suzanne Pedersen for so long and many others. Uh, and that's neat to see because, as you know, doing my job and Kara's job part-time when she's on course, um, the caddies are our primary source of information. And being the type of people we are, um, they're our primary source of dinner companions because we're not, you know, we don't go to the, the highfalutin parties and get all dressed up. We like hanging out with the real people, and the caddies are the real people of uh, professional golf. Amen, amen. I believe so, too. They're the backbone. They don't get as much praise as they deserve, but it's great to see them out there. And I loved watching the golf challenges this last week. They showed the Meta Heel tournament. I got to see Casey on air for a little bit with Luis, and then Pauly was right there with Say Young when they won that. So I, lo I love it out there. And the caddies are the backbone of the, the girls. That they don't get enough praise. But – well, thank you very much for you guys' time. It's been a wonderful conversation. Totally was looking forward to this. Really enjoyed you guys spending some time with us. Oh, thank you for having us. We enjoyed it a ton. Um, awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Why don't you just stay on the line? We'll just have a quick uh, chat there. Yeah. Awesome.